everybody. Um, we'd like to call the town council meeting to order on September 18th, 2019. So I'll call it to order. First item is Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Councilor Cloutier? Here. Councilor Johnson? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor Caterina? Here. Councilor Donovan? Here. Councilor Hamill? Here. Chairman Hayes? Here. Um, item four on the agenda is general public comment for anything that's not on the agenda um, tonight. So if anybody would like to make public comment, come to the podium, please. Name and address and all that good My stuff. name is Betsy Gleistein. I'm from 14 Long Meadow Road, Scarborough, Maine, 04074. <laughs> um, good evening. Uh, George Packer of The Atlantic recently wrote, watching your children grow up gives you a vivid image of the world you're going to leave them. I'm not here to talk about the whole world. I'm here to talk about our world, Scarborough, Maine, and the community we're building, not just for our children, but for residents of all ages. I'm running for town council to champion, protect, and preserve the unique character of Scarborough that is evolving in ways that I'm not sure we fully understand. What is our town character? In conversations with Scarborough residents, yes. Mr. Chair, okay. themes have emerged. Uh, Mr. Chair, it's my understanding we aren't, uh, public comment is not a time to run for office and to do political speeches from the podium. Sorry, I had, I, Mr. Cloutier, I think you made your announcement during a town council public comment, and I think Mr. Hamill also did it, so I, there seemed to be some precedent, so. Well, that's not for you to answer, it's, so I'm asking the chair and I'm asking. Yeah, uh, tell them what, what has been our pattern practice. <clears throat> I'm trying to think what the policy is. Uh, I think on occasion candidates have mentioned it in the course of general comments, but I don't recall that it's been the focus of their comments, uh, their candidacy. Um, so I. I don't think there's any clear guidance in that regard. Um, I guess what's the will of the, of the council? I, the council? I don't have a problem um, with her speaking. I don't recall making a speech announcing my candidacy either, but... Um, yeah. I, she's announcing a candidacy, but she's also speaking about Scarborough and things that she's observed about the town, so I'm all for it. Councilor Foley? I, unless we have a policy that... Ex explicitly uh, says that someone can't do that, then I have no reason to think we should stop it. And I am also in favor of it. I mean, we've had too many examples, I think, where the public doesn't have an opportunity to speak, and this is one of them. So I, I think that we need to uh, let her continue her comments in the spirit of public comment. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a problem with um, Ms. Gleistein making comments. I do have a problem with someone announcing that they are a candidate for town council from that particular uh, podium. Um, and some of it, I mean, I, I can't off the top of my head, other than we have a, our own policy as counselors right. that we will not, from here, you know, sit here and go, well, I'm a candidate for this and I'm a candidate for that, and we will not support candidates as in our role as town councils, which I know is different. To me, it's just the color of it. It doesn't look good. It doesn't sound good. Um, because this, this whole uh, space is a place for us to conduct the business of the town, not to conduct the business of campaigns. That's just where I'm coming from. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Um, so I think with sort of the flavor that you've gotten is kind of, if there's additional things you'd like to say. Absolutely, thank you. Um, what is our town character? In my conversations with Scarborough <laughs> residents, themes have emerged. We cherish our active, engaged residents of all ages, our great schools, outstanding sports, boosters and activities. We love the access we enjoy to nature. We appreciate the business and civic and religious organizations that support us. And I hear great praise for our public safety and other town services. I have heard a few things we don't want to become, a bedroom community for Portland or the town with the greatest debt per capita in Southern Maine. Folks are concerned about gridlock traffic 
and our degradation to convenient access. <laughs> and I hear concerns about affordability. Will I be able to afford to live here? That's part of our town character too, affordability. Our website says Scarborough is one of the fastest growing towns in Maine. Perhaps so, but I ask why? At what cost? What type of growth? What are our priorities? We can't, <laughs> what can we and our neighbors afford? What growth is required to support our level of spending? Do we want to grow less and spend less? There are not easy answers to these complex questions, as you well know, and I certainly don't claim to be the smartest person in this room. But when making a decision, um, I hope that everyone will listen to all key stakeholders, residents, business owners, elected officials, and our town employees, and make decisions in a framework of asking the big question, how will this impact our town character? Ultimately, we have a great community, um, and I hope that Scarborough residents will take an opportunity with the upcoming elections to think about just slowing down a little bit and taking a breather and figuring out where we're headed. Um, and I'd quickly like to add a, a comment about our ongoing reval concerns. I really applaud that you're holding a workshop on October 2nd, and I urge residents to reach out to town officials um, and candidates to discuss the issue. We've seen excellent professionalism from our town employees during this process, but by almost all measures, this reval represents the town falling short of the duty to provide a majority of residents with predictable tax rates. As someone said to me, I can't walk into Hannaford and tell them, the town says my property is worth a whole lot more, please give me free food. It just doesn't work that way. So I applaud that you're gonna do this workshop and I plan to follow up with some additional comments. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak this evening? I'm Susan Hamill, um, Free Bay Street, Pine Point. And I'd like to talk about the reevaluation again. I, I'm sure most, there are many people on the council who would just like this issue to go away. But I don't think it's going to quiet down. After all, we'll be reminded about it in just about a month uh, when we're paying our tax bills, and then again in March. But I'm here to ask that more information be provided on the outcome of the revaluation. What is the total change in valuation for the town? Why is this a big secret? I have not seen any statistical summary of any kind for the revaluation data. I'm being asked to pay this town a very large sum of money next month, as every homeowner in this town is being asked to pay their taxes. And yet the town has not provided any information other than the committed values list. I'd like to see figures on how many homeowners received new assessments which were higher, lower, or unchanged in terms of total numbers of properties broken down by neighborhood, broken down by the magnitude of the change, say in deciles. I'd like to see the mean and median change as well. And I'd like to see this information by neighborhood, by its size of home, size of lot, type of home, year built, and the price of the home. I would also like to see statistical measures which show that the, re that the valuation model that the town used was actually valid. I'd like to see the median sales ratio and the coefficient of dispersion. And I'd like to see these measures for the data sliced and diced as it should be by neighborhood, size of home, size of lot, type of home, year built, and price of home. These are standards that are used everywhere. And what I'm asking for isn't unreasonable. What I'm asking for is basically if you look at the, t at the city of Bath, at their website, their assessing site, and the results of their assessment, and they have page after page of all the statistical information available for anybody. Every homeowner asks himself the question, am I being valued fairly? And the answer to this question comes from looking at values of other homes in the area other homes which are similar, as well as similar homes which have been sold. The answer also comes when you compare how your change value, how your value changed, and how values changed overall in your area and in other areas of town. But sorry, that seems to be too much to ask the town right now. Finally, I want to talk about the property card. 
I don't think it's too much to ask the town to send it out to all residents. We don't seem to have a problem sending out the bill or sending out one piece of paper with the old and the new value. The validity of the entire valuation process depends on the accuracy of that property description. Do we care about that or not? The cards should have been sent out back in August with the proposed assessment, but should we correct the error or not? What good is the property card without the explanation of how to read it? What are all those codes on the card anyway? What's the difference between typical, old style, and modern when it comes to kitchens and bathrooms? And how is the grade of construction, a key determinant of building value, how is that determined? Without an explanation, the card is of limited value. As a homeowner and taxpayer in this town, I want and expect more. I want to see the basic data, and I deserve it. When I get a big bill, or an unexpected amount, like anyone else, I, I look at the detail breakdown, and I want that. I want to do the math. Thanks. Thank you. Any other public, general public comment tonight? Um, seeing none, we'll close that agenda item. Next item on the agenda are the approval of the minutes of September 4th regular town council meeting and September 10th special town council meeting. Is, so moved. Is there second. a second? Any discussion or comment? Seeing none, all those that approve the minutes, it's unanimous. Thank you. Um, there are no adjustments to the agenda. I've signed the treasurer's warrants. Um, and the next item is item eight, a non-action item, and it's an update from the Scarborough Historical Society on the schoolhouse restoration project. Good evening. I'm Becky Delaware. Um, I asked, because of the support that you have given us on this project, I asked that I be on the agenda tonight so that I can update you on what we've accomplished so far. I have some pictures here of the things we have attempted so far. Um, this summer we've really been amazed at how fast things have gone for us. Um, we expected a lot more surprises than we got. Um, the first thing we did was we had our well checked by Stanley Hillock. They deepened it from 68 feet to 200 feet they removed hand pump parts from the well, <laughs> and they put a new well cap on gratis. Um, mm. We really appreciate that. We had a structural engineer, David Martin, um, offer his services gratis to us, and he has given us advice, confirmed um, what we've planned, and drawn some structural uh, plans for us. We've also had the septic system checked, by advanced leach field. We found that the local squirrels have been using the septic system as a storage system for them. Um, so that needs to be cleaned at some point. And we also found that we don't have a leach field and we need to put one in. We also had Steve Ross come and survey the land um, and put pins in so the schoolhouse can go back exactly where it was uh, before we had it moved. On the second week of July, Mary and son came and began the process of jacking and supporting the building so it could be jacked up and at the request of our excavation person moved back. Um, that ran into a problem almost immediately because where we wanted to move it, there were trees but Scarborough Public Works came to our rescue and cleared the area so that we could move the building back. Um, next problem was the porch on the front was no longer attached to the building, so it had to be repaired immediately or taken off. We looked at the construction and decided it would be best to take it off and rebuild it later. Um, 
Mary's had suggested that we needed two steel beams to support um, the building sufficiently. As we got into it, it was determined by our structural engineer, Ed Mary, and our excavation person and our foundation person that we needed the third um, beam to support it. Uh, we then had Jeff Greenleaf do the um, excavation and it was a big relief to us to find that he didn't hit ledge. That was a big concern for us that if we did, it would limit what we could do. Um, it's all sand. Um, we also had a few worries at the time when the foundation was going in, if we could fit everything into the back part that we wanted to. We were trying to move as much of the modern stuff um, to the back of the foundation so it wouldn't show from the front. Um, and our structural engineer stepped in and drew the plan and said, you put this here, this here, this here, and this here, and everything fits, which was great. We had the electrical conduit, electrical conduit put in by um, Jeff Greenleaf, and he tarred and backfilled um, the foundation. Then we came to the obstacles. We should have known, but we were too optimistic. The sills were dry rotted. Not completely. There was a place here and a place here and a place here, and we thought, oh, we can patch it. Well, we got looking at the patching process and it would be better to replace them. So we've, we have to replace all the sills. The back addition, we knew water had got into the wall. We didn't realize how much damage it had done. It had not only taken out the entire sill, it had taken out the entire wall. Hmm. So we have an opening here right into the schoolhouse. Um, as we looked at the other two walls, we found that they weren't in that great a shape either. So at this point, we need to take the back addition off and hopefully we'll cap it this um, fall and fix it in the spring. I want to thank you for your support on this project. We certainly wouldn't have gotten as much done as we have if you hadn't supported us. Um, I also want to make a personal thank you to Brian Longstaff. He has been great with us. Um, he's helped us, he's cooperated with us, and he's made sure we've got our bases covered. Um, I'm hearing stories from other towns who have done similar projects, that they get one part all done and then, whoops, they should have done something else that was covered in the audience, ordinance or codes and they had to tear it out and redo it. Um, thankful to Brian that he has said, now look, you need to do this, you need to plan for that. And uh, it's been a big help to us that he has supported us in that way. We also are trying to use Scarborough businesses as much as we can to keep um, the resources in town um, the ones that we've used outside of Scarborough are ones that have been recommended by Scarborough businesses for us to go to. Um, so we're trying to support the town as well as get our project done. If you have any questions, I will try to answer them, but I just wanted to give you an update of, we went full steam ahead and then ran into a brick wall. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? No? Thank you very much. So I think the next item on the agenda, agenda is order number 19068, 7 p.m. public hearing with the planning board and the town council on the proposed second contract zone amendment on Larrabee Farms from Grandin. Aggregates LLC, and I think the process is a little different than we've done before. I think we'll move down to the table. It's sort of a joint conversation. There will be a presentation by the, by the applicant, followed by comments from the staff, and then sort of open discussion among the members. 
and moving toward at the end of it a decision of the of the town council about three different sort of ways to proceed so we'll kind of i'm sure we'll be guided through the process so i think with that we reconvene down at the at the table take your name please if you would just so my colleagues yeah, my guys, man. <laughs> So uh, about a month or so ago, we did this uh, similar thing in front of just the planning board, um, but part of the process is having this joint meeting uh, as an update. So, um, so the, I'll start kind of 30,000 feet and drill my way down just to kind of give uh, people some background uh, to this project. Uh, but ultimately, uh, we're requesting a small um, uh, contract zoning on that. So, but I'll kind of back up from there and kind of work back in history just because I assume that the majority of the folks here weren't really involved with the uh, initial uh, permitting of this project. So if you go back 40 or 50 years, uh, a lot of this pro property, particularly the, the eastern part of the property, was an old sand and gravel pit that was opened up. I heard by Desenzo, I think, but I'm not positive, but it's really irrelevant. Um, and then really just left mostly unclaimed and unreclaimed and just kind of sat dormant for decades. Um, and then back in the early 2000s, uh, we kind of looked at that and started looking at the potential for uh, wetlands mitigation to offset uh, impacts on other sites. Uh, so, for example, the, the first one we did was a large mitigation project for the Gorm Bypass. So we created 13 or 14 acres of, of wetlands that used to be an unreclaimed gravel pit, and now it's reclaimed just in a non-traditional way. You know, traditional way was either just grow some grass and put some houses in there or whatnot. So we took a very different approach, uh, which did not meet any of the town's zoning ordinances, hence the contract zone. So um, in the early 2000s, probably 2004, we started talking with the town on the concept, um, started gaining some steam in the 05, and then in 2006, we had a signed contract zone with the town to do this, um, um, you know, excavate some additional soils to get down to the water table to, to make the wetlands work. Um, and, you know, prior to this, we did lots of research with monitor wells and the hydrology because uh, you got to have the water to make wetlands, obviously. So, um, so that went pretty well, um, but shortly thereafter, uh, we're back in front of the town for an amendment uh, because um, to help speed up the process, uh, what we wanted to do was be able to kind of bring in some materials to, to help make um, spec materials for a lot of our construction sites that we do. Uh, so uh, it was agree agreed upon in 2008, just a couple years later, um, to kind of expand some of the functions of the, you know, the, the dirt moving side of things to oversimplify it. Um, so, in, in, so by doing that, it, it, we felt that it would speed up the process of the overall project. Uh, and then over time, um, you know, more wetlands projects came through, which helped uh, with the extraction. Uh, and, it, and it did, I think, speed up um, the extraction process as far as 
uh, mining the native soils and as well as simultaneously <coughs> managing the uh, wetlands projects. So, uh, so if you look at the site, I just wanted to kind of point out um, where this is. So this is uh, basically uh, the north side of the map. I think your laser pointer will really only work up at the front. Okay, so Thanks. this is uh, Route 114 um, up in here, and then over way to the left is uh, Beach Ridge Road. So just to kind of get you oriented on where this project is in the town. Uh, and the project is, is uh, I should have used a different map and I meant to update it, but it's all of this colored area as well as all of this area over here as well. So it's even bigger than what this shaded area is. So all of this area is part of the project. Um, so, uh, so, and just as it relates to the town, um, here is uh, some existing town-owned uh, conservation areas. You know, the marsh obviously being the single biggest one, but ours is the red one up towards the top. So it kind of, you know, just kind of gives you an overview of what the town is. So there's really nothing up in that area except a small little project right here that the town owns currently. And this abuts right up to it, which is, which is nice. And then the, the southern part right in this whole area abuts the Nunsuch River. So uh, end game is when this project is 100% uh, complete, this will all be in conservation uh, in perpetuity. Uh, similar to these other projects. So I think it will really round out the holdings of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the town as far as conservation land and, um, and whatnot, you know, and as, you know, we have a bond coming up. And, you know, so obviously the town feels very strongly about that. So this kind of gives you a picture <coughs> of how this project fits in. Uh, some additional info just to give you kind of a bigger picture is you know, we're over 300 acres this entire project. Um, 95 of it was existing wetlands, over a mile of frontage on the Nunsuch, which we've talked about. Um, we've talked about historical use a little bit. Um, and then, um, so this is a timeline which really maps out the last, you know, 13 years of the project. So we've kind of talked about the first, first part of it. Um, so, you know, 2006, we had the original, then we had the Gore Bypass. We had a, uh, our second one was the Cabela's site. Um, that was a fairly significant creation area. Um, the amendment in 08, uh, 09, we had uh, another uh, project that was built, um, you know, over 100 acres for the jet port expansion. Um, and then our, our latest one was 2012. Uh, it's been pretty quiet since then. Um, the state has kind of changed the rules a little bit as far as wetland mitigation. Um, so haven't had any big projects lately. Uh, got a couple irons in the fire. Um, so um, and then so and then in 2017, uh, that's when we had. So basically, when we create one of these projects, uh, it's required by the town, Maine DEP and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that we, uh, after we build it and des design it and build it, that we have to monitor it for 10 years um, regularly and make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to do. So in 17, we had our first, you know, the final checkbox um, done. Everything was done to satisfaction. Um, also in 17 uh, was the last um, quarry glass that we had in there because we were uh, not only uh, digging out sand, but also rock. Uh, so that's been done for the last couple of years. Um, and then we've also um, got uh, last year the Cabela site was signed off. So that is, you know, 100% complete. Uh, it's met all the criteria through all the agencies. Um, and then um, the final sign off for the jet port is pending that likely will happen later this year. So the, the final letter and documentation to all the agencies has gone in. Um, leaving just the last smaller um, settler's green um, that is still midstream, we're about halfway through with that. So, um, so some of the history um, from now is, so talking this spring um, with Jay and the planning staff is, uh, so when we made the amendment back in 08, so the original um, contract zone in 2006 had a 20 year time span. And then so when we said, well, if we can kind of change how we're doing it, we can shorten up the time, which it did work. But um, 
we kind of lost track of time, both the town and and us. Um, and that was uh, partly our fault. Um, we had um, some personnel change. Um, so um, our technically our 10-year window has, has lapsed. And so that's why we're before you with a with an amendment proposal. So basically, um, we, we'd already, even before we realized um, that we'd uh, overlooked some of the time frame of the agreements, we had already started ch changing the functions of, of our operation, you know, bringing, not bringing in more material. Um, I, my goal is to have the majority of the, the kind of our day-to-day earth-moving functions done by the end of this year probably be some roller over in the next year, but uh, we're not bringing more material in. We're trying to just get it out at this point. So um, talking with Jay, um, he thought maybe the simplest solution is, okay, let's just ask for you know a small extension as far as you know, <coughs> trying to get all the piles and all the aggregate related stuff out, you know, you know, say by you know the end of next year at the very latest. I, I foresee the majority of it being done this year. Um, but what we'd really like to see is it's a great project. You know, if this is built the way it's designed, because we still have about 15 or 20 acres of wetlands creation, uh, as well as the surrounding preservation um, left. So um, we'd really like to be able to finish the project, um, you know, by closing it out with the wetlands creation, uh, as opposed to just a traditional. Um, I, I think aesthetically it'll be nicer for the town. Um, so, so it's kind of a two-pronged uh, request. We'd like to have a little more time to, you know, get the, uh, you know, the dirt moving um, functions done, um, and then, you know, is it as easy just going back to the original 20-year agreement that we had back in 2006? So, yeah, or something to that effect. You know, we'd like at least a few more years or call it five or, you know, whatever the will of the town is. But uh, we do think it's, it's doable. Um, it's just, like I said, some of the rules have changed with the, with the state as far as people's options, developers' options with uh, wetlands mitigation. So, um, but I don't think it's, you know, uh, I don't think it makes the project not viable by any stretch. So that is the basic request, is uh, just um, it's a pretty straightforward amendment. Uh, work with Jay on, on the wording. Um, so that's our 30 or 40 year background, and <laughs> uh, I think that's all I had. So I don't know if there's any questions uh, from, the uh, from you guys, or Jay would like to say anything first. I think maybe Jay, I think, you know, at least the outline was kind of presentation by the applicant mm -hmm. and some, some comments from, from you and they kind of opened it up for questions. That Absolutely, is. sure. Yeah, so the, the memo I put together is really just sort of echoing what's in the, in the ordinance yeah. and to help guide us. So, Tom, did you have anything or do you want me to jump right in? I'm, ha I'm happy to do so. Um, so, uh, Mr. Grandin just gave you a pretty good background on the pro project, so I won't, I'll sort of dispense with that. Um, but as was noted, you know, it really did come, it came to our attention this spring that the contract zone amendment, um, you know, that shortened this time frame, we had gone past that 10 years. And so, you know, uh, Mr. Grande and I got together and had a, had a, a good conversation. I said, look, okay, we're, we're currently in violation of the of this contract zone ordinance, but what, what can we do to remedy this to make things right? And, and I think one of the things... Um, that my staff, Jamel and I, were able to do is go out on the site with uh, Mr. Grandin and see sort of the aggregate work that's being done. And, you know, I, I was very impressed by the site. So one of the things, I, you know, I, I would just sort of say is that while there are currently compliance issues with the contract zone and the timing, the work on the site has been done satisfactory, satisfactorily. So, you know, all the wetlands mitigation work, if anyone's had an opportunity to go out to the lands that are currently open, at the end of Larrabee Farm Road. Um, it's a really great example of wetlands creation in the state, and I believe this is one of the only projects, if not the only project in the state, that's created a man-made vernal pool that's actually functioning year after year. Um, and so that's, they've, they've really done a nice job of that. Um, but 
you know, again, we recognized in the spring that all these good things still don't remedy the, uh, the, the non-compliance with the contract zone. Um, so um, that's really what we're here to talk about tonight is what, um, you know, what is the will of the council in terms of the remaining, I think it's some um, 50 acres or so, I may have the number wrong of where additional wetland creation areas could be. Um, you know, and is it, you know, worth the town's um, sort of patience, if you will, to wait to try to get those wetlands created before having the conveyance to the town? Um, and, and then we'd have that added benefit um, uh, for the community. Um, and so I think as Mr. Grande said, it is a fairly straightforward request. And I think the, um, with also with the sort of uh, what's being written into this contract zone is that by the end of next year, as Mr. Grande mentioned, that all that aggregate will be off the site. Um, and then it's just a matter of marketplace. Um, I think that's one of the things that maybe hasn't been mentioned is when this contract zone was originally adopted, the wetlands mitigation happens when projects in another area of town, as it, or in the state, frankly, as was mentioned, Cabela's or the jet port have impacts on wetlands. They need to mitigate those. Um, and so the DEP, it used to be that really their only option was to create wetlands elsewhere. Shortly after this contract zone being uh, uh, adopted and the project getting underway, the DEP created a new rule where folks could actually just pay an in lieu fee mm -hmm. that goes to the DEP and then they use the funds for other purposes, conservation related purposes. Um, so I think that probably hindered some of the marketplace for wetlands creation. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that's, that's about what I wanted to, to touch on. Yeah, I'll just offer a personal comment. Uh, I was generally aware of this, but never been to the site. Uh, the spring when Jay brought it to my attention, uh, I had the pleasure of going out there and I was just simply uh, amazed by the restoration in particular and the sort of public access and um, certain conservation opportunities that are afforded far better than just the kind of the wild land, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I, I appreciate firsthand kind of the, the finished product and how that could be a real resource to this community for decades. Only last thing I wanted to mention, um, so thank you, Tom, or else I would have forgotten to. Uh, we did receive an email today from an abutter um, that I believe council and planning board members uh, have copies of. If not, I'm mm -hmm. happy yes. to share that. So. Okay. That is, that's all I have, and again, happy to answer questions as we go with, as requested. You know, one thing I did fail to ex expressly say is when this is done, you know, ultimately the Scarborough Land Trust will control this land. For the, for the whole community. And one slide that I did forget to show is uh, the, the areas in the orange up here, um, those are the remaining um, um, wetlands creation area potentially. Uh, and then you've got surrounding uh, uplands, you know, wooded areas uh, around that. So um, that's it. My understanding is this is step three of ten. <laughs> <laughs> Two was with the planning board last month, and this is number three. So, just pa patience is a wonderful thing. That's right. right. No, Perhaps to yeah, tee this up it. for the next conversation, I just want to be clear: the request is twofold. One is to allow additional um, material handling, if you will, through the end of next year. That would be December 2020. Yep. Uh, and that said, I, I do believe the majority will be done. By this winter, spring, okay. you know. But then, I'd rather go a little longer and not have to come back. That um, yeah. we've already, you know, uh, as my timeline showed, we, in January we started um, taking mm -hmm. some of the functions <coughs> of what had been there for ten years at other locations. And the second part of the request was to simply fall back to the original timeline uh, for the to run through twenty twenty six, if my math is right. Yeah, yeah. correct. Okay. And that was just, you know, it's just like any negotiation. That's just the first, first shake. I mean, if, if the town wanted something quicker, then so be it. But it would be nice to, to finish the project as far as the wetlands creation side um, <coughs> as designed. I think it, it'll make a, a complete and nice project. Um, and as Tom alluded to, there will be public access when it's done, which would be really nice. Because without that, there's not much in that corner of the round out the, the holdings of the overall town conservation areas nicely. So with that, does anybody have any questions?
question? Yeah, so I think I read that there were 20 acres or around there that was going to be granted to the town that could be used for a municipal uh, facility or school. Yep. Does this impact that at all? No, nope, that's already been granted it's to the town. That was one of the first things that was done. Okay. Uh, one of the, probably the second thing that was done was uh, some upgrades to Beach Ridge Road. Um, so all those things have been, we've worked with the town engineers and, and all that. Um, so basically, um, aside from that, um, the land is still in our possession. Um, granted, you know, two thirds of it is in conservation easement already through DEP and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, but we haven't, but we had to get all those requirements done with the uh, state and federal agencies first before we could, you know, deed it over. So at this point, we've got um, two projects 100% done, you know, final, final, final sign off, and we're waiting for the third one uh, now, which we anticipate, I would think, by the end of this year. So um, we could consider doing one big chunk now, you know. It, be easier, you know, there's a lot of legal work and, you know, all that, so it'd be easier to clump them up all at once, you know, maybe do it in two, two phases or maybe in just one big block at the end, but, so, it's not, it's clear what will happen, it's just the timing as far as, you know, do we do that at the end of this year or do we just wait until it's out? so, I think it could go either way. And the, the total of that, is, is, do I hear 50 acres, is that right? The total site is 300. Right, plus. but what would be conveyed to the land trust? Oh no, the whole site. The whole site. What's remaining right. to be um, either wetlands creation or preservation is, the, is okay. Uh, it's around 60 or 70. Acres, okay. I think. The actual um, creation area is between 15 and 20, depending on what the needs are of future clients, and then there's always surrounding upland preservation areas that are associated. Is there public ac access to it now, or? There is on the east side, because there's okay. no construction activity. Yeah. Um, so there are some basic trails over there. Um, um, as far as, you know, we're still actively working there. So, right. you know, it is limited now because okay. of safety issues, obviously. So it's not signed and, and not encouraged. It's just, so sure. that's yeah. certainly the, Makes sense. the challenge right now. And the unmitigated areas, like so the 50 acres that are yet to be, what do, are those still just a quarry or is that yep so quarry? probably about uh four acres or so is the old quarry yeah um 10 acres is is our kind of stockyard where we process materials and you know store them and then the rest is basically wooded you know or the roadway yep. but so a lot of it's wooded actually and my last question is given jay's comments so you, you're at the mercy of the market to know when this is going to finish but you said that there's a couple Project yeah, there's some right. major transportation projects that are coming up in the very and near future. You're feeling pretty confident that those are going. To, okay. Yep, that's a that's probably our best chance. So that's and we've been in talks with them. So. so if we do extend it, is there a chance that that we extend it, nothing happens for five years, or it's a, there's a chance. Okay. Yep, and so basically, you know, talking through that with Jay, it's just yep. well, if that's if that's the case, then two thirds is built the way it was designed, and one third will be kind of traditional. Reclamation, you just yep. flatten it and grow some grass, and you know. So that is a possibility. It's a possibility. Right? Yep. Okay. So, which you know will still be fine. You know, right. It, it'll right. still all be reclaimed, and we'll still have the public access. So. Yep. Uh, yep. A couple of questions, if I could. I don't know who's driving in terms of the slides, but could you help us understand that there's a, three different maps in here that show sure. various things? So you, that's. The one that says they're potential wetland areas, yep. and before that was. You want to show the existing one? Yeah, the existing one. Okay. That's fine. Yep. So this one in the green right here, that was the first one. That's okay. the MDOT Gorm Bypass. Uh, and then the second one that happened uh, was the Cabela's yep. over here, this whole area. Okay. Uh, and then shortly after that was the Jetport, which was this whole area, yep. as well as this area, which is actually part of. Um, some of the Rod and Gun Club on the other okay. side of the river. Um, so um, part of that 2008 amendment was, uh, I believe it was 53 acres or 58 acres of preservation. Um, the Rod and Gun Club couldn't do really anything with it anyway. Yeah. And what it did was actually...
actually protected both sides right. of the nut such right. for half a mile, or I'm not sure exactly what they did, but and there's which is very desirable on a conservation. Thank you. That's very helpful. Yep. Um, the third one I was wondering about, though, is buried somewhere in the documents farther along that shows it was with the original deed. Could you and it's highlighted? Do you have that one in your packet? It's in our packet. Um, I didn't receive a packet from them. So, so highlighted in the deed? It's in well, the original it, deed, I think, and it shows... Uh, I think it's oh, the okay. one you had sent us. Okay, okay yeah. It, and it shows an area that's around, though, that's bigger than the... Uh, yeah, so, two, so on this Yeah, that's the yes. one. So the area in the yellow is the entire project. Okay. I, I meant to replace this map with that one. Okay. I forgot to. So I'm happy to send uh, this around if anyone would like to see it. And this shows other areas that could be converted to what Correct. So the area to the left over here, um, this area primarily here and a couple smaller ones in this area are, you know, open space, you know, they're open now, they're cut trees. So basically, um, the way BP Army Corps looks at it, they don't want us to mow down a bunch of trees to create wetlands. But if it's already impacted, which it was from previous use, um, then that's desirable. So, so yeah, if you look at that other map, um, these are, oops, wrong button, sorry. So this whole area is, is the areas that were shaded. So this and the orange are the the three smaller areas. So this is approximately 10 acres, this is five-ish, and this is just a couple. So it just depends on what a future client need would be for, um, but even all the, oops, sorry, not right, all thumbs here. Uh, but even all these areas around these orange areas are mostly wooded, would be, be considered preservation. Because uh, every package has a creation area as well as upland wooded preservation area. Um, but as I understand so that the contract zone is originally defined as not being changed by this amendment in any way. It's the same parcel all in. That's correct. It's just yep. the time frame for the aggregate and at this point it's getting aggregate out. They're no longer creating any more aggregate doing any material production so to speak and the time frame going back to the original 20-year agreement. Right. Right. Yep. So it does not change the property boundary. Can I just ask a clarifying, clarifying question on Councilor Hammer's question? These, the two larger areas shown in, in orange here, mm -hmm. the largest one on top, is that the where the material handling is happening? Yep. Where you're, yep. That's where everything. So is if you picture this is an area of large stockpiles, um, the other area is that the the corner area. That's the that's yep. That's where everything and, was. And I mentioned that because those are two areas that are kind of open and undone at this point, and right. so. If those are the ones to be chosen and restored, there'll be a, a much more, uh, a better finished product, I right. guess is what I'm trying to right. say. I suspect the other one is uh, wooded or not. Sure yeah, it's, it's less desirable. Okay. Um, first choice would definitely be the stockyard and, and the quarry area, for sure. I w you know, we've already started reclaiming some of the quarry. I'd say at least a third, if not half, is, is already sloped and, and, um, and vegetated. So, uh, if it would be a benefit, perhaps we could arrange a site tour. It really is something that you need to see sure. to, to fully appreciate to the before and after. Yeah. Uh, that's something we could do in fairly short order. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, uh, one other question I had that was following on to the letter query from the to the, the abutter. They have, now, they were not specific in the concern that they raised. They talk about. Uh, having quote unquote having to deal with oversized vehicle traffic until 2020 to remove materials that are brought in for sale and use on other jobs so have we had any complaints so far and if, if we have what type of they been and you know um, and i'm really asking from the standpoint of a, i don't know where this falls from an ordinance standpoint whether it's a good neighbor ordinance or if it falls in a traffic ordinance realm but i, I want to make sure we're respectful to uh you know what one of butter has raised and see what uh, what do you feel about that? Yeah, in, in my time here, um, we haven't had too many complaints about it. I know there have been, and I think recently there was a, a bit more uptick in traffic coming and taking materials off the site, so I think people noticed that, and we had one or two calls about it. Um, but I think there was sort of a, an uptick. Maybe there was, you know, pro product being delivered to a site, and that sort of stopped. So. Um, I wouldn't say we have an abundance of complaints. No. Okay. 
And the issue would not necessarily be an ordinance violation per se. Uh, the issue is that the the use that is potentially bothersome is allowed only vis-a-vis -vis this contract zone. Without mm -hmm. the contract zone approval, that use would not be occurring uh, next door. And our, our, our goal is to be <coughs> substantially done, you know, by this winter. But I'd like to have a little more wiggle room and not have to come back again, you know. Um, it's gotten to the point where, you know, we're just not getting enough throughput out of there, so it's not, it's getting to the point it's not economically feasible to, to stay in there much longer. So our, our goal is to try to get you know, the majority of that material out uh, this season. Uh, to the point that actually uh, the, the three of the larger piles of you know, finished material that we have, I, I put on sale this week until Columbus Day. So that we hopefully try to you know, get it moving, you know, literally. So, uh, Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I've got a good sense of the argument for why it would be a good idea to extend this. But I have not heard, what is the argument for not doing it? Does anyone have an argument for why we shouldn't do this? I think the abutter raises the obvious concern that there's activity <coughs> occurring uh, in some proximity to residences that uh, wouldn't be happening otherwise. And beyond that, I can't think of another reason why not to. And, yeah, and the time frame to wrap this up is? I, I suppose the other piece, and this is a question I was going to ask of Mr. Grondin, is that apparently there are continuing um, actions on the part of state and federal agencies to finalize things before ultimate transfer. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes some sense to keep them in the game to finalize those pieces so we actually can receive a finished product that has all the I's crossed and, and uh, T's crossed and I's dotted. Um, I think that's an open question if they are to not receive this and we're left with things that are open and undone, uh, it would be nice to have the assurance that we're going to get a fin finished product with all the assurances that it was done right. Um, so the only, and I don't have an argument for why it shouldn't be done. My only thought was, you know, one thing I know in, in all project management is, you know, all work fills the time allowed. So we're already way past the original uh, time frame and, and if having a, a little bit shorter deadline is going to help expedite things, maybe that you know would be my only concern. Joseph? Discover Land Trust, you're, we're not Discover Land Trust, not purchasing this from you, correct? It's just transferred over. Correct. Okay, I just wanted to yep. say that aloud and make sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It, it just, it's all written. In yes. Eight yeah, but, or ten days. Yes. Yeah. And if I could, just to be clear, it. it it says it can be conveyed either to the town or the land trust. So I think that's a conversation yep. with the, that the land trust would be a party to. I just want to make yep. sure that's. Yeah. I just want to make sure. Yep. Clear, so. mm -hmm. Yep. But it is conveyed. I just want to clarify and push that. So if I hear you right, the concern that we got from the constituent was the noise. But you're saying you're going to have the bulk of that out early winter, is what you're saying. With that's a little that's my goal, and that's yes. the plan. So that's yep. really short term. Yep. But I think to build on Councillor Foley's request. As I understood the way Tom framed it up, you're also asking for the wetlands piece for an extension to 2026. Is there a way to, sh what's the consequences of shaving some time off of that? That's fine. Yeah, yeah we just, that's fine. So if, if what would be reasonable? I, it's, I don't know, it's, it's a <laughs> yeah. ball question. Yeah. I think. yeah, I mean the- You know, so I mean, we could say, hey, we could just add five years instead of, you know, if, if we just undid the amendment, or a part of the amendment, it used to be 26, because it was 20 years right, from the original right. so 26. That. So that would just, I, I, I drafted it, I'm not a lawyer and I don't pretend to be one, but we said, well, that's, that's easy, we'll start there. So there was really no magic to it, it was just like, well, that was the original, so maybe it's just as easy to go back to that. If there's a desire to, to make it four or five years, you know, just for the wetlands. Mm. Yeah. The extraction piece, just the so. I was looking at the proposed uh, draft amendment, and I don't see the 2026 reference. Can, that, can someone point that out? It's, it's really the reference to going back to the 20 year um, time frame of the original. Um, Is it under the now therefore uh, provision? So uh, yes, it is under the now therefore. Um, and 
it is the number one going back to basically to, to read it, you would have to read the other two contract uh, zones before you, um, and so it's, it's number, it is number one, the requirement for the conservation under three, section 3P three shall remain in effect in the requirements of section 5 and 6, which are the ones that reduce that 20-year time frame to a 10-year time frame, are voided. Okay. I will say that uh, Mr. Grande and I worked on this language together, and I'm not an attorney either. The, uh, the staff will certainly run this through our town's attorney. I want, just wanted to get a sense of council and the planning board's will before going through that process. So um, there may be refinements. Well, thank you. I understand how you did it. Yeah, um, yeah I, I've actually walked on the, where the trails are or going to be. Um, it's, it is really nice down there. It's nice. I actually like, I prefer that we not disturb wetlands at all. But if you're going to disturb them, I like making them somewhere else so that we aren't just paying lieu, you know, uh, fees and loops. I don't think that does anything for anybody, but that's neither here nor there. I absolutely support, um, let's get the, um, grinding and aggregate stuff done because I know the neighbors up there they've had, they would like that finished and I get that I definitely think that it's, uh, keeping a longer timeline for creation of wetlands makes sense um, I, I have no idea with whom you're speaking but I know the turnpike is looking to make some uh, <laughs> some widening um, and um, I'm certainly a big fan of getting traffic off from 114 at some point, so I would like, you know, yeah, let's keep that door open for the creation of wetlands in there. So that's where I'm coming from with this. Sorry, can you set me through, let's say that you sign a contract tomorrow to uh, build out the remaining wetlands. How long does it take to actually create them, and then how many years after do you need to test and monitor before you get final approval? So. Um, Basically, they need to be designed, and it's based on what the impacts are from the, the site that needs the mitigation. Um, and then as far as build-out, I mean, obviously it depends on size, but I mean, if you're doing a 10-acre site, that's probably going to take a couple months, a couple, you know, two to four, no more than that, and you still have a bunch of plantings. you got to get it to grade, uh, plant it, um, and then, you know, then all the microtopography, and there's little mounds and stumps and all kinds of little features that they that they require, um, but so then that's, and then then there's regular monitoring, you know, weekly, monthly, uh, but it's a 10 year cycle as mm -hmm. far as start to finish. Uh, so the first, I believe it's the first four years, there's an annual report um, to DEP, the town, as well as Army Corps. I think year five, it's just kind of an update, and then it, it, every other year it's a, uh, or full report, update, full report, update, assuming everything's going well, and then on year 10, you, it's your post-construction construction assessment. They literally count every single tree or every little plant so that you're meeting the density requirements. It's, the reports are literally 40-something pages long. So would you be looking to hand it over to the land trust or the town after all of that testing is completed and all the signoffs are done? Okay, so the, yes. we're talking at least 10 years, though. So. Yeah, so like I said, two-thirds of the overall project is complete. Done, done. Yep. Other than the one letter we're waiting to hear back from. Should be by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. the, the, all the reports are in. It's just literally sitting on someone's desk to be reviewed and check the final box. Um, so yes, it, uh, and then there is one small project that's, uh, I think it's year five, so we're halfway small but still we're you know doing all the reporting um and that actually just went in recently this fall um as far as the annual report so yeah if we sign one tomorrow yes it'll be 10 years before it's you know done done as far as the monitoring the building doesn't take that long in the grand scheme of things so. and can you could that be handed over to the land trust and, and still with that being open-ended or do we have, would we have to wait 10 years or can those reports and the updates happen by the land? Um, I don't know. Um, I would think you could, but I right. guess I'd have to read the fine print to be honest yep. with you. With all due respect. I'll have that answer I, for you at the next meeting. I wouldn't want the town and 
Street for Land Trust, but I'd be surprised if they would be interested in yeah. assuming Taking ownership with responsibilities. Right. Yeah. So, right. unless there was an agreement spelling it out that we were. I, I wonder if, yeah. should this move forward, there should be something in writing that yeah. explains or requires Grandin to continue doing yeah. that and ultimately conveying at the time he can. I'll have that answer for you the next time. So, so as a general, we you kind of heard from town council that day. Do any of the planning board members have anything to share? Their views, their thoughts, yes, questions, so concerns? Sure. My name is uh, Reggie Hendrickson, and I'm the vice chair of the planning board. And I, I would like it noted that we have a quorum here. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the planning board, Rich DePerry, Jennifer Ladd, Rich Meinking, Roger Bailey. Did I miss anybody? No. And me. <laughs> um, and uh, I. The developer, the applicant, is absolutely correct. There are 10 steps to this process. And I, I must inform the gentleman he's at step 3B. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Devil's in the detail. <laughs> so, so there will be a lot more discussion of this on, on the planning board. But we've already uh, taken a look at that. Uh, and as I see it, what what you're asking right now in terms of responses from the board, uh, I'll, I'll quote Jay, um, basically, is it worth it? Is it worth the extra time to, to make those three remaining areas into wetlands to recover them as wetlands, or they simply could be reclaimed and done, essentially? other than whatever sign-off is, is required. Uh, so I would like the planning board in, in their comments to, to say, is it worth the time uh, to really reclaim all, to really make all of this land into the wetlands and then start to think about or hand it over to the planning board or the town council and an attorney to figure out how to structure an agreement that would allow that to happen in such a way perhaps as the land could be used sooner than 10 years, um, but without, let's say, the cost being assumed by um, the town or, or the land trust. So if we could start over with Rick, is it, is it worth the time? And any comments about, the, about this project in terms of value? see the cost obviously burden to the town and the land trust has a lot going on as well so um, I think it's worth the time I just hate I don't want to see the cost put back on the town to develop weapons. I know some people feel more strongly about wetlands and I, I think they're important Jen? Um, I would agree. I also think it's worthwhile to leave that window of opportunity open for this type of wetland creation. Um, this, uh, Jay or, or Mr. Brown had spoke to this before, but um, this type of opportunity seems fairly unique. And so, um, the idea that our community would be a place where we would welcome um, the introduction of new wetland area and um, larger and continuous wetland area rather than someone mitigating 200 square feet or half an acre at a time um, to, you know, at, I'm not a wetland scientist, but like whatever level, quality level of wetland you get at that size versus what um, our community would stand to gain from, even, you know, a larger continuous resource like this, I think it's just really unique and something that we should um, support. And <coughs> that um, there are potential, um, you know, obviously the market for this is subject to all of our overall um, economy and construction market, uh, but the fact that there is, you know, irons in the fire, I think is how you worded it, um, <laughs> is at least you know promising if not not a sure thing so um i think this is really cool i was not aware about this until it first came to us on the planning board 
Um, I can't wait to go see it. I hope there's a field trip. If there isn't an actual field trip, I'm going to make one of my own. <laughs> um, so I just, I just think it's really great. Um, it's a, a cool thing for our community. Um, just a simple question about the sort of in um, response to the letter that was received, um, someone commenting on the truck traffic that they're experiencing now. I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to what type of um, trucking or other activi equipment activity is um, typically associated with this type of wetland creation. So as far as the day-to-day -day operation, it's, it's typically just a front-end loader and dump trucks coming in, um, taking material out. Um, occasionally, um, you know, historically, you know, uh, oh, 17 is when I, we had our last um, quarry blast. So when we were actively doing that, we, we did have rock crushers in there. Occasionally, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't 10 months a year or anything. It was probably one month a year, you know, or maybe twice, you know, a year. Um, that's primarily gone. Um, so now it's um, a little bit of screening, just whatever remaining um, topsoil that's in excess of what's needed to close out the project, and that's about it. And so the comparison for this particular abutter or any of the abutters there, the difference between the type of trucking activity that they're seeing now as you're finishing up your aggregate operations versus what they might see in seven years when you're building the wetlands in that middle parcel, for mm -hmm. example, what type of, um, I know you talked before about manual plantings and things like that, but I would imagine that the activity necessary for this wetland creation is much less than yeah, what they're so seeing there, right now. There would be probably a need to uh, haul some of the material off-site if sure. it was a large wetlands creation project, you know, even after, um, you know, the, the period of, you know, actively working it on a daily basis, which, like I said, I. My goal is to be primarily done this this winter, um, uh, and then so at that point, you know, day to day stuff is done. It's just kind of hurry up and wait. If the project does come, there would be some trucking in and out, um, but it'd be sporadic for for the project. Sure. And so in that case, it would be short term, specific to the project. In that sense. Thanks. Before I give a quick answer. I have a question on the Settlers Green. Um, do you still anticipate getting, do you anticipate getting sign off like in 2022, I think? So we're at year five on that. Okay. So that'll be 2024. 2024. So that helps with the decision of yes, this is worth the time. Thank you. Other questions? All right. No, ma'am. Roger. Um, I, I think it's certainly worth the time also, um, especially when I suspect most people in town didn't even know this thing, this place existed. So, I, Well, that's a good thing, right? That's right. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm not making too much of a ruckus. <laughs> um, I, I do agree with um, Jean Marie, though. I think um, anything you can do to alleviate the, um, the heavy trucking mm -hmm. as soon as possible. But I would certainly wait. I mean, it's a freebie that the town's going to be getting, so doesn't make sense not, not to take the whole thing. Yeah, and I, I do want to make that clear. There is really no cost to the town. So whether it's reclaimed as a wetlands, we're doing all the work, it'll be done. Or if it that doesn't happen and the remaining is a traditional closeout, you know, just a regular reclamation, again, we will do all that work. So it's it's not worth We're not giving a half-done project to the town and saying, here you go, clean it up. So I just want to make that clear. So either way, it'll be done and reclaimed in one way or the other. Uh, and I think it's worth the time. Um, I like the coherence of a complete wetlands up there, a complete wetlands system, rather than some sporadic areas of wetlands and then all of a sudden a traditionally reclaimed or closed out area. Um, we have seen uh, the recovery of quarries in Scarborough recently uh, with projects before the planning board uh, and it's it's been exciting for us as the planning board to see how 
uh, developers with imagination are taking property that I would look at and say, nothing is going to come of this ever. <laughs> nothing can be built here, nothing, it, it can't be used for anything. And folks are really bringing forward some tremendous ideas. Uh, to have a coherent, uh, complete wetland area up there for the town of over 300 acres, I think, is a, a real plus, uh, added to the fact that it's free uh, and the work will be done uh, by the applicant. Uh, I do think the town needs some pr protection to ensure that uh, any monitoring is continued uh, by the applicant. Uh, it makes sense that that be a, that the continuity be there as well. Uh, and I understand the but is concern. Um, it's closing down, and I'm sure Mr. Grandin will ensure that it proceeds apace and that it really is done by uh, the December 2020, if not considerably sooner. That's, that's my personal. And we look forward to seeing you in uh, the uh, number step four and five and ten. And please. So I, I was in a meeting probably a year or two ago where I uh, it was mentioned that the municipal campus was out of uh, or at, at its max development or close to its max development due to wetlands issues. And my question is: Is there opportunity here for the town to partner to transfer uh, you know potential? wetlands areas in our municipal campus to this area or not? Um, Jay's probably more qualified to answer that question. Uh, I don't think there's a direct uh, opportunity for us, but certainly we could, uh, as any other developer, if you will, building in, in back in wetlands, uh, take advantage of uh, restoration on this on this site as opposed to paying new fees. So we, we, indirectly, we could certainly take advantage of the opportunity. We certainly see the value of where the impact occurs. Let's have wetland created as opposed to it happening in Rooster County. Um, yeah, it's desirable it. by all agencies to have it as close, to certainly the in the same watershed. Yeah. Right. Um, right. You know, if you can have it in the same town, even better. But and for us, there's a recreational component that uh, is really kind of an added benefit as well. Should the boards uh, see this favorable, at least conceptually, I, I would recommend that we work on some additional language to really um, articulate ongoing responsibilities for Grandin to do the due diligence to close out the project. It sounds as though even with this requested extension, those responsibilities will extend beyond that date. And uh, people smarter than me can come up with some simple language, or maybe not so simple, but language that makes it clear that there are ongoing responsibilities um, beyond. I, I think the current language is quite thorough, but it's definitely worth revisiting now that you know this much time's come and we're actually looking at the end rather than 15 years yeah. ago saying, oh, it'll end someday. So yeah, no, that's proof. True. The original contract zone clearly contemplates and, and yep. makes the responsibility uh, for Grandin to do all that, but I think there's also was there an assumption that that work would all be concluded within the original 20 years, and I think we now realize that that's not the case. So. I, I think some fairly simple language can yep. address that. Yep, sounds prudent. So I, I guess with that, we'll see no more comments from either the planning board or town council. Are there any public comments anybody that wants to come up and address the decision? Yep. Yeah. 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 Probably the best bet. Yeah. A name, and address, and share with us your thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Mike Mason. I'm at uh, Amanda Lane in Scarborough. Uh, I'm an abutter on the uh, Beechridge side. Um, and I have been aware of the project. Uh, but I also do think that it is worth waiting. Um, I, I think Grandin has been a good neighbor um, and has kept um, good faith. And I want to thank them. I've, I've talked with Larry sometimes on the phone, and I want to thank him for his transparency and, and the openness uh, that they do their work with. So uh, I do have a couple of questions. Um, the first is um, from reading the materials and from what Larry said today, it sounds like there is not going to be any additional blasting uh, or importing of materials. 
Uh, I'd like to confirm that, and if that is the case, um, I would recommend that that be written into the uh, into the amendment. Um, although I, I guess I have a question: if the quarry site, which I believe is the the middle site, uh, were to be um, converted into a wetland, would that require uh, importing of of fill to do so? So that that's just a question. Um, I. Um, I, I do, I, I do have comments about the uh, heavy vehicle traffic on Beach Ridge Road. It is um, extremely high, and, and I happen to live and, and I happen to um, have a bus stop where uh, it's uh, around a blind curve and at the bottom of uh, a, a fairly long uh, hill. So uh, some of the large uh, vehicles um, are are moving um, well over the speed limit when they pass um, my bus stop. Um, where my daughter has to cross Beach Ridge Road, uh, by the way. Um, first of all, I, it, it's, uh, Grandin is, is only a fraction of the um, dump trucks that, uh, that do pass by on Beach Ridge Road. Um, uh, although I, I, do, I did notice that in the original 2006 agreement, there is a, 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 a clause about uh, no uh, exiting left out of the site on the Beach Ridge Road. Um, and I would just ask for consideration that that be adhered to. I, I don't believe it is uh, right now. Um, I also have several questions um, that can somewhat be lumped together regarding uh, public use and recreational use after the conveyance. Uh, there is a lot of reference in the original uh, agreement uh, to trails. Um, and uh, development of trails, um, and I, it's unclear to me at least uh, who's responsible for actually developing those. Um, is that part of the, um, uh, the agreement that, that is supposed to happen before the conveyance or after? Um, and if so, uh, what's the timeline for, um, for public use of, of some of those things as it relates to the completion of active work and or the completion of wetland mitigation uh, period. Um, there's also reference to uh, uh, actually where the trails are um, and that uh, timing and location of the trails should be approved by the planning board and I'm just unaware if any of that has occurred uh, or if it is how we can find out what that information is and if it hasn't, what's the, what's the plan for, for doing that? What's the plan for maintaining and policing those, uh, those recreational uses and, and so on? I, I think that should be um, clarified uh, as we uh, update the agreement. Um, thank you for your time, I appreciate it. And again, I uh, wanna thank Larry for um, his openness and willingness to work with us and thank you to the, uh, the council and the planning board. Thank you. Anybody else want to come forward this time? So I guess with close out. Okay, can, can Larry respond? Is that okay? Sure, yeah. yeah. I'm just I'm curious about that. Yeah. If I may, whether it takes to see, I think one of the things I would like to touch on is the, the public use and the uh, creation of the trails. Um, I think as has already been pointed out, we're at step three of 10. Um, this was certainly one of the things, and Larry and I have already started talking about that, that I think the planning board would really take up as part of their site plan approval oh. process. I've been going back in the old files trying to dig up, and you know I think there's, there's general agreement around trail creation, but we really need to have that better codified in our files around what that looks like. So that is something that as this process continues, I would see the planning board taking up. Certainly if the council wants to do more in the contract zone, certainly let staff know, but um, um, we'll be reporting back to you on that as we as we go along. Um, but certainly I'd like to answer a couple of his questions that, that benefit the group, I think, and, and also just 30,000 feet talk about some of the trail uh, concepts and what's already um, so, um, the only thing that's really been important lately is uh, we're, we have been bringing in some fill, and I uh, pointed that out to Jay when we, he was out there a few weeks ago, just for reclaiming the, the uh, you know, when we left the quarry, it was literally a, a straight up face. So we have been bringing in some just excavation from job sites uh, to build those three to one slopes, and that's really the only thing that's coming in at this point. Uh, there's, you know, there's no finished product. Um, 
As far as truck traffic turning left, I'll look into that. If we are doing that, it, you know, it was the understanding that we would turn right because uh, that's where the, our road upgrades were done. Uh, so I will certainly look into that. Um, and then as far as public use, um, you know, I think there could be some level of public use um, in, a, in addition to what's already there on the east side. There are so, uh, some trails that lead over to the active areas. And those have been built already. Um, so from the you know the, the DOT side, there's a there's a trail that comes over and it traverses the entire length of the Jetport uh, creation area, um, and it leads right into where we're working. Uh, yeah. And then, um, fortunately, I think it'll be quite easy for a lot of these trails to get connected because a lot of the existing uh, roadways where you know our trucks have been going will just basically mm -hmm. cinch down and become trails. So um, what is 100% reclaimed, you know, to the east where the DOT, um, there are some proper trails. They're, you know, six feet wide, and, you know, uh, so it, it has already begun. And then, like I said, a lot of the existing roadways will become trails. So, uh, we're not, we won't get into the weeds on that tonight, but we'll get that on four, seven, and nine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you will. <laughs> So with that talk, maybe you can help walk me through, we now as a town council need to put a motion forward. And we've got basically three choices. Right, we need to make one of three findings this evening. Yeah. So the, the first finding would be to withdraw the request, that's one. Two would be to continue the pro process, the request for contract zoning with or without the modi mod modification suggested and what we've talked about tonight. And the third is to, re to revise and resubmit the application. So I think at this point, if we're ready to entertain a motion from somebody. Uh, Council uh, To continue the process uh, that has been uh, advanced here tonight. I'll second with, that. With or without modifications. He's doing number two, right? He's yeah, doing number two. Uh, uh, without modifications. Without? Without with modifications. I second it. Second it. Mm -hmm. um, discussion. Anybody got a question? Uh, if if there were modifications, I'd be happy to uh, yeah. to hear them. I just didn't hear any that were obvious at stage number three. Could could I ask just a clarifying questions? Uh, question on the without modification, as I would understand that that you're generally comfortable with the the um, the proposed timeline and such but having the attorney review it and come back you know having the legal review I guess that's the type of modifications that I would still think we would undergo um, but I, my, my assumption is Mr. Donovan's motion without modifications is you're comfortable with going back to the original 20 year time frame and the 2020 closeout of the aggregate work um, so that that's how I'm interpreting that motion so I just want to be sure staff's clear on what Oh, uh, this is. Uh, look, I'd like some clarification. So, the way I'm understanding this process, and I'm just throwing it out, is that this is just a preliminary direction for how we're going to move forward. It's going to come back to the council at some point. So, I would agree with Mr. Donovan that um, the way he's worded it would be fine because this is all very preliminary. Just get it to the planning board; they do their thing, and it's going to come back. So, I guess the only clarification I'd like to have, like. For me, without what I'd like, when I heard that, what I hope gets embedded in the conversations or some of the comments that were heard tonight, I don't know if that needs to be in the motion or not, but I think there are some great points brought up. But as I understand the process, that's going to be part of your normal process. Is that so again, that, 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 that's 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 my understanding of it is that when this comes back to council, the, the contract zone language may have some modifications, but it'll be really around the legal documents and the type of elements that we've talked about tonight, but not on the, the, the broad general principles of going back to the 20 years and the 2020 time frame. And if that's the, um, if that's sort of the will of the council, that, that's my understanding. So I just want to be sure I understand the will of the council. I, no. <laughs> I <respect> <laughs> <laughs> 
can't get rid of it. Um, you know, if I had my druthers, again, I would probably shave off a year or two. And I know that may or may not seem like much, but again, it's it's around, you know, just trying to put the fire a little bit closer to get, get, it, get it done. But it's not, for me, it's nothing to hang my hat on and also sort of die on. Like, it's not going to make or break my support for the project. I do think it's worth uh, doing it all the way through. So that would be my only, you know, but I'm very comfortable moving this along two step, what I was going to be, 4V or 5 or wherever <laughs> it is. But yes. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I'm okay moving it forward as well. And I think from my perspective, I don't have any council stipulations or changes that we're, you know, we'd try to stick on you. But I, I would like you to address a lot of the questions and topics that came up today. And maybe take a look at the language and make sure that, that you know, the town would be on the hook for some of the monitoring uh, at, at the end of the project. So, but no, I'm in favor of moving it forward as well. Seeing that, or we all must not. Just to clarify, my motion was made in the spirit of the remarks by uh, the planning director uh, and Mr. Cloutier and uh, Ms. Foley. So, are we ready to vote? Mm -hmm. So we are, all those in favor. So I think that thank you for spending your evening with us. Thank you, I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> Get a few landing boards on the council side. You're going to say right here. Thank you for all the work that was done. Thank you very much. If you can just... Uh, Planning board members, if you just want to leave your names there, I'll pull them up. Appreciate the time. Wow, why is it? Everything looked purple for a second. Okay, we're going we're gonna to continue the meeting. Um, the next item on the agenda is order number 19069, um, and that is uh, first reading schedule of public hearing on the proposed amendment to Chapter 311, schedule of fees pertaining in lieu fees for affordable housing and development transfers. And Tom, I don't know if you I'll want to interrupt. Quick introduction, I think I'll flip it to Jay. Uh, interestingly, this comes uh, before you from two of your advisory committees, both the Affordable Housing Alliance and the Conservation Commission. Jay's had the occasion to meet with both. Uh, so it's a fairly unique, I can't recall another time where there's been a, uh, an initiative come uh, jointly from two of your bodies that you've directed to, uh, to work on, on various matters. So uh, I think Jay can probably introduce the detail of the matter. <coughs> Hello. Thank you, Jay, <laughs> Jay Chase, Planning Director. Um, so let's see, I'll, I'll give you a, a background. I certainly hopefully have my memo on the, on the items, um, and so I'll just touch on some of those. I will point out that Marge DeSancta, the chair of the Housing Alliance, is here, and she said if I don't touch on everything, she will come up <laughs> and, and make sure that we, we, we hit all the highlights. So as has already been mentioned, this recommendation is coming to you from both the Housing Alliance and the Conservation Commission um, to uh, increase the um, uh, in lieu fees for the affordable housing and the development transfer uh, provisions in Chapter 311. That's our, uh, our fee schedule essentially from $20,000 uh, per unit to $50,000 per unit. This discussion really began several months ago uh, with the Housing Alliance. Because um, they, they realized and, and, um, and, and noticed that developers um, were taking more advantage of the paying the in lieu fee um, rather than developing affordable housing units, um, as is allowed by our ordinance. I want to be sure that's clear that this is our ordinance spells out that this is really developers' choice, quite frankly. And so um, they've been doing exactly what's allowed, um, 
but that the $20,000 goes towards our affordable housing, um, uh, goes to a fund, a town fund that's to be used directly for affordable housing purposes, and I think council's actually allocated some monies um, recently to that end. Um, but I think one of the, com the conversation with the housing lines has been, well, $20,000, you know, it would be behoove the town. We'd li rather see units built and brought on into the marketplace uh, that are affordable um, rather than getting the funding, recognizing that the funding doesn't actually get us a whole unit. So that's really where the conversation began. Um, and so uh, as that conversation evolved, um, I was part of those on and off as I typically am, uh, help out staffing. And, and sort of as part of that conversation, I, I identified for the Alliance that, well, you know, when we start thinking about the in lieu fee, we also need to think about our development transfer fee because those two are really linked together in our ordinances. Where in our ordinance, in our higher density um, and mixed use zones, we have these provisions for um, uh, density bonuses. We have both the de development transfer as an opportunity and affordable housing as an opportunity. Again, it's really developer's choice in that matter. Um, they can take advantage of either um, situation and the in lieu fees uh, are also synced together. Um, because if one fee for one of the two provisions was significantly higher or higher than another fee, most folks would take advantage of the, of the lower fee and we'd essentially be creating a, uh, uh, you know, uh, we'd be creating an imbalance in the market, in, in the ordinance, so to speak. So, uh, <coughs> as part of that, I had a conversation with the Conservation Commission. We took a look at the development transfer provisions. Development transfer provisions actually have a, uh, a prescribed measure for the council to consider um, adjustments to the uh, fees. And it's really taking a look at the costs of raw land in the low growth areas of our community as defined by our comprehensive plan. So in this memo, I, I sort of spelled out the, the work that um, my department did uh, recently, really following the same pattern that was used back in 2006, 2007, when the, when the ordinance and the fee was originally uh, adopted. So we haven't looked at it in, in that amount of time. We're talking 10 or 12 years at this point. Um, and, <clears throat> pardon me, and as the memo demonstrates, what we found is that the statistics show that the uh, mean for raw land costs are about $37,000, um, and the median was about, around, it's $50,000. Um, and so as part of the ongoing conversations, the Housing Alliance um, and the Conservation Commission both sort of talked about these elements and are recommending that $50,000 be the um, consideration for adjusting the in lieu fees. Um, so I think. We had we had talked about the 50,000 for for quite a while and um, Portland is a hundred thousand mm. and so uh, and, and like Jay said if if we leave it at 20 the difference between a market rate house and an affordable house to the developer is is greater than 20. So they're going to just pay the 20 and build that market rate house because that's going to bring in a lot more profit. If it's 50, that comes really close to what the difference is between a market rate house and an affordable house because we went through all that with um, um, who was there at our meeting? Um, oh, Rizbara. And so when we were doing the calculations on the median income of what person can have to be, you know, to qualify for affordable and spending 30% of their income on housing, what you could sell that affordable house for. And doing that calculation, and Rocky would say, well, what we could sell the market rate house for versus the affordable house was about 50,000. Hmm. So we came up with 50 before Jay did his wonderful numbers that came up with 50 as well. <laughs> so, um, so those were some of the other considerations that the Housing Alliance looked at um, it, to make it more equitable so it wasn't just a slam dunk, it's easier to pay that low fee and not, do a, not build affordable because our goal is to build affordable. So that, that was another reason why we came up with the 50. 
Thank you. Oh, I'm Marge DeSantis. <laughs> I didn't say that. Does anybody have any questions while they're there? Uh -uh. Seeing none, thank you. Um, does anybody in the public want to speak to this? Seeing none, we'll close public comment. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Um, discussion? Councilor Katarina? Oh, okay. Well, I'm Kate most excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just, I'm very pleased to see this come forward. I mean, I think going back to my very first year on the council, I thought 20,000 was way too low. Um, I would have probably gone to 70. So um, anyway, I'm pleased that this work has been done. And, and uh, I know from being the liaison on the <coughs> Conservation Commission, they were in full support as well. So. Thank you. Uh, I also support this uh, 50,000 to me is should be more in my opinion but that's all right I can live with the 50,000 um, just because of what uh, property prices are in Scarborough now and will continue to be uh, and there is an absolute lack of affordable housing opportunities for people um, as well as substandard housing which is another issue that uh, we really need to be looking at but I was happy uh, to see uh, this $50,000 fee so I would support this. Council Jonathan. This is actually a question so I apologize. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I try to get my hand up it was quick. <laughs> is there evidence that when Portland went to 100,000 that it actually increased the supply of the affordable housing or did they increase to 100,000 in Portland? Well, some of them are still just paying 100,000. And do we know do we know if it if it was successful in reducing the amount of developers that were paying the in lieu of fee? Do we know that? I mean we can find, I'm sure we can find it pretty easily. I, I do not I did actually have opportunity to meet with you may have seen in the paper in the last few months the port the director of planning in Portland yeah. left and yeah. before he left we actually had a chat and I told him what we were working on and asked him about right. how they uh, came uh, arrived at a hundred thousand dollars and it was sort of a political negotiation yep. it's <laughs> what as I was informed but to your question I don't um, it does my understanding is that many developers are, are paying the in lieu fee um, rather than developing the units but I you know, I, I wouldn't sort of bet everything I have on that, right. but that is, right. that's the, um, I guess I just said that that's been my understanding of it. I haven't done any exploration, real study on it. So, so, so I guess to play a little bit of devil's advocate, if our, if our goal is to actually increase the supply of affordable housing, the mechanism of increasing the, in lieu of fee, doesn't seem like it, it has paid off completely in Portland. I, by the way, I still support this. I'm just, I'm just. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So perhaps, but perhaps it's worth getting some numbers. It right. still gives us more money to give to affordable housing developers. No, and I agree with that. But when we put out RFPs and we only have one response, we're still stuck in that conundrum of yeah. where's the supply of the affordable housing. But with that, I'll yield the floor. <laughs> I just have one piece of anecdotal evidence. I've talked to the city manager in Portland. I, I believe many are paying, uh, right. so that doesn't appear to to be an absolute deterrent, but um, interestingly, they're not they're not actually choosing to create them. They are choosing not to pursue a density bonus, and so I, I think that's something we've got to monitor fairly closely. What is the effect in the marketplace of this? And that was actually, uh, I'm sorry, no, uh, um, one one thing that I did want to point out that one one of the other significant differences here in Scarborough, it is a density bonus. Okay. Um, yeah. okay. In, yeah. in Portland. They have inclusionary zoning where developers have to do something gotcha. for affordability. Okay. Yeah. We do have inclusionary zoning. Um, the uh, Crossroads Plan Development District, the Downs, is our yeah. only district that we require that right. affordable right. housing. Yeah. Every these other zones that are referenced in my memo, yeah. it's a density bonus. And um, these are so all site plan reviews. Subdivision. Yeah, yes. Sub yeah. Okay. Was it clear? Uh, yeah. I. Uh, I guess I'm curious what other options were looked at, and uh, kind of along the lines of what um, Paul and Tom were saying. It, if, when I just think logically about this, if you're increasing the cost for a developer to develop housing units, then that's going to have a negative impact on the supply of affordable housing. And if you had companies that were willing to come in and take advantage of some of our RFPs, then maybe that's different. But I, I feel like what this encourages is more expensive housing on one end and then subsidized housing on the other 
as opposed to inclusionary um, zoning like in the crossover. Yeah. No, you can talk. Let's go to the podium. I would like you to talk. <laughs> There are other things we're looking at besides this to okay. try to encourage uh, affordable housing. And one of them is we're talking about a marketing plan for the RFP because uh, when it came out, it was right during Pan Planapalooza and all these other activities that the town was doing. And we really didn't do a focused marketing. We sent it to a few developers that we knew or talked about it here and there. Uh, and then after about six months, I think, uh, we said it should be on the the web, uh, you know, Scarborough's front page. So then it got put on there. But there was never a full blown marketing. This is our RFP. We've also changed it so that we've taken the dates out of the RFP, so it doesn't have to come out in April and get turned in by August or whatever the dates were. So you, so it's a rotating. Anytime you have a project, you can do the RFP. Have you looked at any other mechanisms to encourage affordable housing, like inclusionary zoning or voucher programs? That inclusionary zoning is on our agenda list of things to address that we haven't uh, we haven't begun. Okay. okay. Any other discussion on the motion? Um, I guess the only, the only place I contribute, I will support it. I, I would like to see it to be higher, also, um, but. I, I think it's. I think it's a great step forward. It's well, and like I said, we we need to we need to look at what it's going to do to density bonuses and yeah. mm -hmm. you know how that's going to affect things. And then it doesn't <clears> apply <throat> to the motion, but I, I think how long was it that we set this? Was how long ago was it that we set the twenty thousand and twelve years? Twelve, so, yeah. yeah. I did About like you know years. market the market <laughs> rates change all the time, so I'd love to shorten that cycle. So well, we maybe we should time. annually review it. <clears throat> Every year we are reviewing, um, annually we are reviewing what the AMI, the area median income so, is, and what, um, who qualifies and how much that dollar amount is. And we've set up a um, spreadsheet on how to calculate that every year using the AMI. So we could just say we're going to look at what the market is and review all numbers associated with this once a year. And that way... Um, if there's and, and by then too, if we wait another year and do it, we'll be able to tell did it have any effect? Yes. Did it did it affect density? Did it affect you know any any other areas? So that might be a way to do it. So on this motion, are we ready to vote? Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Thank Same you. Answer. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Next item on the agenda is 19070. <coughs> Act on the request to set the date, time, and location of the municipal elections for Thursday, November 5th, 2019 at the Scarborough High School. Alumni Jim, appoint the warden, deputy warden, set the hours for voter registration. Act on the appointments of election ballot clerks pursuant to Chapter 200, Article 8. Um, nominations and elections and authorize the town clerk to make any additional appointments as necessary. Uh, that's a a lot of words. <laughs> <laughs> is this standard procedure? Yes. Um, is the requirement of Title 32 which governs municipal, municipal elections as well as um, um, Chapter 200 of the, the town charter? And I request that it be approved. Is there so moved. a second? Any discussion? Oh, any public comment, I imagine? <laughs> I'm assuming not, but. Um, so it was second. Any discussion? See, see no discussion. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Um, Article 19071, act on the request to approve the names of residents to serve on the Ad Hoc Community Center Advisory Committee as recommended by the Town Council. And Tom, I think this has been your labor of love, yeah, so to speak. Uh, first, I, I want to compliment members of Council. Uh, council uh, for the Public's Benefit, the Council convened last Wednesday the 11th uh, in executive session, reviewed uh, some really stellar candidates. It was uh, a fairly challenging process to, to work their way through that, but they, they really, uh, uh, I think, had a, a very sound system, and it was a really good process to be part of. So I congratulate the Council for taking the time and to really be thoughtful in this process. Uh, I did have the occasion to reach back out to all of these folks. Um, since they expressed interest initially, the Council's actually established the charge, so I shared the charge with them. 
uh, reaffirmed that they continued, their interest continued, and I'm pleased to report that all of the folks selected uh, indicated so. Um, I'm also aware that there is a uh, the second school board member, um, and perhaps that can be offered as an amendment tonight so we can complete the full composition and we can get moving. So with that, is there any public comment on this? Is seeing none, we close out public comment. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Um, and I, I think, Tom, you need a motion to amend. Just um, to. Who is it? Uh, Sarah, but. Sarah. Okay, yeah, so I'll motion to amend the. Yep, to add Sarah Layton as the second DOE member. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion to amend? That's unanimous. And okay. back to the main motion as amended. Tom, do you intend to read the names? Oh, certainly. That? I beg your pardon. I overlooked that. Uh, the, uh, this is a total composition of uh, 13 members, nine of which are voting. The voting members uh, under consideration are Sarah Boone, Isa Doe, Kevin Freeman, Amelia Kurtz, Stacy Newman, Patrick O'Reilly, Matt Scyther, Denise Smith, and Matt Tonello. Non-voting members, uh, two members from the town council, John Clucci and Paul Johnson. And for the school board, uh, non-voting members would be Leanne Casionis and now Sarah Layton. So with that, um, back to main motion. All those in, are we ready to vote? Any further mm -hmm. discussion? All those in favor? James, great. Um, item nine um, is standing in special committee reports and liaison reports. And I, Don, you want to start? Council Hannah? Yes, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, uh, I wanted to just have a couple updates. One was uh, just from a planning board standpoint, I'm a liaison to the planning board, and the um, the public hearing that we conducted was a result of amendments that we made to the process process for uh, the contract zone amendment and original applications. We are now following the same process for that, and I know a lot of people participated in that on the council. It was also vetted through several committees. So, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of times uh, public process might feel more like a hockey game than yeah. a symphony, but sometimes when it works, it's, it's more like a symphony tonight. So I want to thank everybody who participated in that. And it's a good example where I think we had a, otherwise if we didn't have this, it would have gone straight to a vote. And I think that would have been tough from a number of dimensions. So um, just thanks to everybody for that. On finance committee, we had a, a finance committee meeting last night uh, that ran pretty long, um, but it was uh, very productive. We'll be coming back to the council with uh, uh, some recommendations for how to do some, uh, take advantage of some uh, market conditions that would allow us to refinance some of our, some of our capital, some of our bonds. So I mm -hmm. want to thank Tom for flagging that and getting mm -hmm. it in front of us right away, and, and in particular for Larissa uh, and also Joe Gutierrez who came here and and on very short notice and gave us a very mm. good presentation. So we've done this before and, and it helps to improve our present value and also our cash flow. So um, we'll be looking forward to discussing details with, with the council on the second. Um, uh, the other thing I'd say is that we have another uh, joint finance committee meeting um, next Wednesday between uh, the Board of Ed and also the town council. We've had a uh, couple of meetings so far with good results. Uh, we'll be talking about metrics. We'll also be revisiting a, a rubric which uh, <laughs> Councillor Johnson uh, has introduced. But uh, we'll also be talking about timing effects and, and what sort of requirements the, the town and, and the board both uh, would like to see in terms of making uh, the timing of first and second readings and exactly what we're looking for at each of those <clears throat> clear and, and and putting them on the calendar in a way that will allow them to be productive. Um, so, uh, so we'll look forward to coming back uh, with more details on that. Um, and and uh, the, the last thing I'd say is on Echo Main, I'll be uh, attending a couple meetings tomorrow as we get back on a regular schedule for Echo Main. Uh, and we'll be uh, uh, in a finance committee and also an executive com committee sessions, but they're continuing pressure on uh, on recycling and dealing with municipal solid waste. So, uh, you know, that's something that we've, you know, that we continue continuing cost pressures on that and other things that uh, we'll be discussing as a town. So those are my updates. Thanks. Thank you. That's 
a sustainability committee uh, met yesterday, and we had a presentation by uh, the two young interns, young adults, one from UNE, the other from USM, who spent the summer uh, uh, going and looking at the trash, uh, really the uh, recyclables, to make a determination whether or not there was a high degree of contamination in it. <coughs> contamination in this context is materials that cannot be recycled. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, two young people were very impressive. Not an easy job. <laughs> Up early, uh, a lot of leg work, uh, and the presentation they put on was, was, was quite impressive. Um, the uh, marked barrels uh, were found to be significantly improving over the course of the event. So the education that was going on by being checked, by being flagged as not in compliance, and giving information to how they could bring themselves into compliance really had a very positive effect. And uh, uh, Echo Maine had set some pretty high uh, fees charged for circumstances where uh, loads were being rejected. And we, I think some recent months ago, we had a $10,000 charge just for rejected loads. So. And this is, of course, all because the quality of the recyclable materials has gone way up. You have to have almost no contamination. It's a very small percentage, whereas before, uh, China really was the instigator of cracking down on this. They would take almost anything, uh, and so it didn't make a difference. Uh, it was very interesting to me that they identified, uh, because the materials would get laid out on the floor of Echo Main, and these young interns went and they observed it and saw how it was graded, that uh, the biggest contaminant is plastic bags, the kind of bag you get at a grocery store. Uh, and uh, plastic and cellophane kinds of wraps mm -hmm. that you would uh, unwrap something with and then just throw it in the recycling. Those two represent about 55 to 60 percent mm -hmm. of all the contamination in uh, recycling. So if we could just correct that, uh, we'd be doing well. Uh, so I think we found that the um, education process that Jamie Fitch has been advancing uh, on uh, recycling, that this program uh, uh, was successful, uh, and let's see what else. Uh, uh, I think the, the conclusion that people are coming to is because of the atmosphere in which recycling exists today, uh, the better judgment, and historically we have wanted to recycle every single possible thing you could, uh, the better judgment at the moment is when in doubt, throw it out. And that really is the, the mantra that uh, is going on at the present time. So it was a, a good exercise, uh, demonstrated that you can achieve better rates of uh, recycling. Uh, and I think it was a very good experience for a couple of young interns. That's great. Yeah, it's a good thing they weren't checking my trash. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have missed a couple of meetings. My husband had a told me replacement, and I say that about the trash because he's going to kill me. But you have to take a saran wrap and wrap it around the incision to take showers. I said, we go through more saran wrap. It's not, it really makes me mad, but anyway. Um, it's not good for the environment. Uh, but that being said. But, but I digress. <laughs> but I digress. When in doubt. <laughs> when in doubt. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. I'm wasting everyone's time. Uh, ordinance will be, it was supposed to be tomorrow, but because of people's schedules, it will be moved to the 26th, which is a week from tomorrow. At 4 o'clock, uh, we are working very diligently on the marijuana ordinance. It's not an easy thing to get our, I mean, we're getting our hands and heads around it, but we want to make sure we do the right thing before we bring it to the council. So uh, um, the ordinance will be next Thursday at 4 p.m. Uh, yes, the communications committee met, and, um, oh, sorry, thank you.
the communications <laughs> committee met and are, are diligently re-pursuing the, uh, taking a look at the SWOC analysis <laughs> that uh, Mr. Johnson handed over to us that we didn't quite complete. <laughs> so um, kind of trying to re-get re, re their feet under them. Um, but I do want to mention we're also having our next community roundtable. It's an opportunity to come out and speak to us about anything that's on your mind. That's going to be on Tuesday, September 24th at Wentworth School at 6.30. Uh, we'll have snacks. So that's always a good draw. So come on out and tell us what's on your mind in regards to things going on in town. Uh, the Conservation Commission uh, met as well. Um, they were kind of reviewing the, I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, they're in the beginning process of an 18 month project uh, that will wrap up in about December 2020, but it started with a field trip uh, last month all around town looking at high water marks um, from the 1978 Nor'easter. And uh, hopefully they, what they'd like to see happen out of that is culminate in, in some kind of a mural project down at Ferry Beach on the bathhouse. Mm -hmm. And they're looking to uh, get some of the students involved because um, they feel like having a, a really strong visual uh, mm -hmm. will help folks kind of understand the danger of sea level rise and, and what that could really do. Um, and they were very pleased about the $2.5 million land bond that we approved. Uh, just wanted to... Uh, share that as well. And I'm going to add one more thing to Councillor Donovan's um, notes on the Sustainability Committee because Jamie shared this with the Conservation Commission and I thought it was uh, quite remarkable um, that they're pursuing a SoulSmart designation for the town of Scarborough. Um, SoulSmart is a, I'm going to just read this, SoulSmart is a program funded by the Department of Energy that helps local government reduce barriers to solar energy growth and make it easier for homes and businesses to go solar. There are three designations, gold, silver, or bronze, and by preliminarily looking through their criteria, it looks like Scarborough will actually qualify for the gold designation. So uh, we could become a soul smart um, community, which I thought was cool. And that is it. Uh, I have none except for just to say publicly I'm excited to get the um, community center process underway and it's going to be a lot of work and it's going to be fast and furious and I'm excited to be a part of it. And I, I echo Councillor Johnson's statement there. I, I'm excited to get going working on the uh, community center oversight uh, committee. So, thank Great. you. Thank you. Tom, Tom Andrews. Yes, uh, a number of things. I'll try to be quick and brief. Um, after we're still 10 years in process with the uh, FEMA re revising flood maps, just just Jesus. think about that for a moment. 10 years, and they uh, have still yet to produce final maps. Uh, most recently, November of 18, uh, 2018, we did file an appeal regarding the most recent uh, release of those maps. Uh, and just quickly, by way of history, the largest impact that we are concerned about is really the effects of properties in and around the marsh area. Uh, the sort of modeling that was used and proposed by FEMA in those revised, revised maps really had dramatic and, and really not uh, effects that we just think were outlandish and had tremendous impact um, between three to 400 different properties in town. Um, just last week received notice uh, along with every other community in um, Cumberland and York County uh, who filed an appeal last November that our appeal was denied. Uh, they did provide some detail as to the reasons for the denial. We have met with our consultant and we'll be resubmitting, uh, addressing those, those deficiencies. And I think at the same time also requesting something called a scientific review panel. This is, uh, a, it's akin to mediation. Both parties pick uh, a panel of five scientific ex experts that's able to come together and impartially, independently view the data and make some decisions. So. I hope we're finally uh, uh, on the right path to, to move to closure on this. Uh, public safety building, uh, there's kind of a dynamic situation. We've got a design issue that we're working with our architect and builder on, having to do with uh, compliance with the uh, fire code on the exterior wall. So you'll, you'll notice uh, on the main building, uh, masonry has, has stopped, and that's a bit of a concern. Um, particularly as weather is starting to set in. But um, I'm very pleased the team continues to work as a, as a team. And uh, we'll uh, sort out these differences. And I think the committee is going to want to schedule some time before the council to give you a, a broad and general update. But that's a, a, an issue that's just unfolding right now. 
Uh, I'm not sure if you've noticed, but the tower has taken its full height. Um, the tower is at 180 feet. Um, just a point of, of fact, that, that overall height is a requirement and a function of our own communication needs to make sure that we are reaching all corners uh, in areas of town. Uh, the committee also decided, uh, I think correctly, to um, build a tower in such a way that it could house up to five different cellular providers. And so we'll be undertaking a process to identify um, uh, potential providers and, and their significant lease revenue that we expect. And I think we'll see it as soon as the next budget year. Um, Pleased to report the navigator position. Uh, you might recall through the budget process, I believe we have that starting October 1, so we're well underway. And a number of excellent candidates, uh, a really robust process that's involved uh, a similar position in South Portland, which we've kind of modeled this after. Uh, Steffi Cox from Project Grace has been part of the interview panel, uh, as has the librarian. These are folks that are dealing with many of these issues on a daily basis and have a really, uh, I think, uh, helpful view and perspective. Uh, so hopefully by the next time we meet again next, we'll have worked through that recruitment. Uh, the, the ongoing tax appeal, uh, we're about five years into a tax appeal uh, that's, that's landing back at the uh, law court. I previously advised oral arguments. Um, they have been rescheduled to Tuesday, next Tuesday the 24th at 11.10 a.m. And anyone who's interested, it's open to the public, so anyone who's interested certainly can come. I'll provide some directions <coughs> if you're interested in coming. Um, it's about 20 minutes of time uh, actually before the law court. Uh, the, the tragedy that we've all witnessed in Farmington, I just want to report uh, the fire community uh, statewide and nationwide is strong and uh, Scarborough Fire certainly um, has uh, offered its support. In fact, we have a crew that will be manning a 24-hour shift tomorrow to allow their staff to get some time with their families and uh, there are six members of that department, one of whom is deceased, that are, uh, you know, so they're really challenged at this point. I'll also note that Jim Butler, our code officer, uh, has personal relations. He grew up in Jay and mm -hmm. knows many of the folks on that department, uh, was there, and, and we, we've supported him in the last couple of days. As you may expect, an explosion of that size, there's, me there's much collateral damage. The building itself is obviously leveled, but there are associated collateral damage. So as a uh, commercial code officer, he's actually uh, been lending some support to helping them work through that in, uh, as efficiently as, as possible. Mm -hmm. So. We're pleased to help. Uh, and lastly, I'll just mention uh, there is a revaluation workshop scheduled for your next meeting on October 2. We expect to cover a number of areas, um, uh, a statistical overview of uh, the results. Um, those results are still coming in, so to speak. Uh, the assessor actually tonight held uh, office hours, if you will, scheduled appointments, and will continue, continue to so long as they're requested. Um, but we expect that's going to start to uh, wane uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, we also want to specifically speak to uh, some of the differences that were uh, identified early on, uh, Higgins Beach, Hillcrest, and a number of questions around the Prouts Neck community. So we will prepare information and speak uh, directly to that. Uh, beyond that, we continue communications, never enough and never fast enough, I fully appreciate. but. Uh, through social media, we communicated out some additional information regarding the abatement process. That same information will be in the leader this Friday. Um, and as was mentioned at the podium, and I think mentioned up here through the last couple of weeks, um, producing some sort of legend to explain and decipher the elements of the property card is in process, and we expect to have that up and available for residents uh, shortly. Uh, lastly, I'll just comment. Uh, Council members have seen one of our town residents and also one of your own have um, uh, have done some fa fascinating things with uh, a lot of this information and found ways to uh, graphically display it. And uh, I'm anxious to find a way to grab onto that um, presentation and find a way to share that out to our mm -hmm. residents. Um, for obvious reasons, I want to make sure that uh, the the, the data has been truth and it's. Uh, it's the right stuff, uh, but I think there's great value in sharing that out. Um, and, and we'll be working. At, just this morning, I spent some time playing, uh, or playing, but looking at um, a couple of the models, and 
Uh, it's truly remarkable and we ought to be sharing that out, but I want to make sure uh, when we put our stamp on it, it it's having all the right inputs uh, and, and as best as it could be. So with that, I'm available for questions if you have any. And I guess wrap up with councillor comments. That's good. Try to think of ways to get people to vote. It's a it's an off cycle election mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> typically low turnout. And I uh, I've been looking at in addition to the reval data some voter statistics mm -hmm. and uh, you, you know there's a certain segment of town that votes every time, but there's a lot of people that don't. So um, if you have any ideas for for helping to drive the vote, regardless of who you support, I think uh, I think it's an important time to start looking into that. So that's all I have. To Thank you, Councilor Jefferson. I. I don't have much. I appreciate Tom acknowledging that. I think there's lots of, there's, it, it, I said earlier today to a uh, constituent that data brings people together. I think we, it's, a, it's easier to find common ground when, when data is easily accessible. So I think we should continue to try to make that data as accessible as possible. Um, and on a side note, I also mentioned, you know, I, I, Mr. Ben Howard, who is, hasn't been around lately, but he's been a big proponent of trying to expand our broadcasting mm -hmm. onto different platforms. And um, I'd be really interested in exploring just how to get us on Facebook Live or YouTube or, or what have you to make, um, you know, sometimes you have to do a little digging to find our broadcasting and that's not all our fault. I mean, whether it's through the cable box or through the website at this point, we can be hard to find. So uh, in that same spirit, I, I hope we work towards making these meetings more accessible to people at, at, in their homes. So. And that's all I have. Uh, yeah, so we kind of rushed through the, well, not rushed, but we went through the process around the ad hoc committee pretty quickly tonight. And I just wanted to say thank you to all those who applied because we really had, what was the total, like almost 50 people uh, put their names in the hat. And for a uh, ad hoc committee, that's remarkable. Um, we need to have more and more people getting involved in things like that. So um, we couldn't pick everybody, although we wanted to. We, we tried to balance it uh, in a lot of different ways, and I think we did a good job overall. Um, so thank you to those folks. Definitely get out and vote. And I do have a couple of dog suits that if you stand on the corner and get people riled up, it seemed to work a couple of years ago. We got a lot of people out to vote, so you're welcome to borrow them if you want. If I could, I did communicate with, uh, out with all those that expressed interest. Uh, I used it as a marketing opportunity to uh, make them aware of other vacancies that currently oh, exist. Yeah. Uh, remains to be seen if, we, if, if they're interested in those. But uh. that's for Katarina. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm just going to return to uh, since we're talking about elections that I would like to see the council take a look at. I have to say I've only been on the council since 2013, um, but I do have memories of other years because I've always been involved in watching council meetings and whatever but I've never had a person uh, who's a candidate come up and make uh, an announcement of the candidacy from the podium before and frankly in my own opinion as you saw I don't think that's an appropriate use of this podium um, leave the political stuff outside back in I think it was the late 90s or early 2000s it was a big brouhaha and this is why we have some of the rules we have for our own council activity um, where people were bringing in political signs and their you know uh, supporters <coughs> and it was not a very good situation here in in the council um, so I would discourage people from doing that Certainly, as candidates, come to the council meetings and speak on, on things, but just don't be standing there saying, hi, I'm Joe Schmo and I'm running for town council. I just think it's inappropriate. So, um, And I may talk with you guys about doing something formal around it, but I would rather not. But I was, I was disappointed. Let's, I'll just put it that way. That's it. That's it, Donna. Uh, I'd like to echo Councillor Clutier and Johnson's support for the Community Center Committee in getting this launched. Uh, it really needed to move forward and it needed to move forward fast. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that we took that initiative. Uh, that should not be understood to mean it's going to happen. 
Uh, this is a blue ribbon committee, uh, and they're going to look very hard at the numbers. And the numbers are going to really be a critical element here, whether it gains the support of the seven members of this town council. Uh, because we are in a time where we have a lot of things that are being requested, and we need to establish priorities. So uh, where this fits in will be really dictated by how good a deal the Scarborough Downs people provide to us. And this message is really going out to the Scarborough Downs people, that it needs to be a really good deal for us. Uh, <clears throat> and I think this is the committee to do it. Uh, uh, cell phones, hands-free, uh, I think it starts yeah. tomorrow. tomorrow. Be aware. Uh, so uh, I have <laughs> been a, a, a guilty of using, holding my cell phone a hundred times and probably should not. So uh, I'm, I'm very glad this law is in effect and I hope the police strictly enforce it uh, because it will <coughs> definitely improve public safety. Uh, so many accidents are caused just because you are distracted. We have so much more distracted driving now than we ever did 20, 30 years ago. Uh, the tower is uh, up and it is 180 full feet. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> but Artemis. I would say that when this was, uh, and I went to all those meetings, public meetings that talked about it, it uh, allowed for, I think, five carriers, so it, it can significantly improve cell phone coverage in town and raise as much as $100,000 in additional revenue, I think, uh, on an annual basis. So could, uh, it, it's, when I look at that tower, I look at dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's how I look at it. So uh, last uh, we uh, uh, there was an open house for Southgate for public officials, oh, yeah. and a bunch of us went. It was wonderful. It is a fantastic Avesta facility, <clears throat> and uh, in the course of it, I saw uh, uh, a little family running by uh, the in the corridor, and uh, a few days later, uh, I was visiting some friends of mine in South Portland. And they said, well, we just had our family, our asylum-seeking family, who they had put up in a little cottage that they had uh, on their property in South Portland, and they were a host family. They just moved into Southgate. Uh -huh. uh, and it was, uh, so I think I probably saw that very family. And the report that I got from this South Portland couple, good, good friends, and who have stayed connected to the, to the asylum family now that they're in Southgate is that they were over the moon with the reception they received by the Scarborough school system. Uh, it was quite, quite wonderful. So congratulations, Scarborough schools. Uh, I just had a couple comments. One is uh, I wanted to thank the, the comments, uh, the, uh, thank Tom for his comments about uh, his openness and willingness to look at uh, uses and applications of new technology. If we've learned about anything, there's no way we're going to hold that back, okay? The technology is out there already <coughs> and people are using it. Uh, I've been very <coughs> impressed at, at the stuff we've seen over the past day or so. Uh, where people have been um, working on it, uh, you know, our own John Cloutier and others in the community. And I, I think it, it will speak volumes to the community uh, if and when we share those things with the community and are more open with the data. We fell behind the eight ball, I think, here early on, and I'm not pointing fingers, but I think we've been racing to catch up and get back out in front of this thing. And I, I, I hope and believe that we're finally at that point where we are beginning to trust motives and we'll get the data out there um, and uh, help to do some of the analysis that people have been asking for and close the loop on this thing, get it behind us. I think the sooner we do that, the easier it's going to be for everyone, yeah. and I think that will help us uh, not only as a as a council, but also as a town. And I think this is a good a good <laughs> lesson for us uh, in terms of how to work together more effectively. Um, I also attended the the housing uh, tour at Southgate, and it was really very impressive. And I echo the comments that Councillor Donovan made. Um, I was, it, I was struck at how well renovated the building was, how closely they had uh, fulfilled the, uh, you know, the, the uh, historic status of the building. I mean, really incredible work. Uh, and and it, was a, it had a very nice feel 
to it. Uh, so, so kudos to all those folks that have asked on, on all the work they've done. I do have questions, though, and those are continuing questions that we have. Uh, we just don't have the supply of, uh, of affordable housing. You know, that's getting becoming more critical now with the effects of the reval on a lot of people. And I, I'd like to see, you know, more data on, you know, how, how do we really balance the needs that are here with other needs? I know that we tend to be need-based in terms of the folks with the, the greatest need get, getting placed, but I'd also like to uh, see how well are we placing uh, people who are in Scarborough, you know, our own folks that are right here. And I think we ought to be taking care of them uh, as well, uh, not to the exclusion of other needs at all. Um, and otherwise, I, you know, I think that uh, it was a good meeting, and I, I appreciate the comments and the general tone of it. Um, I do take issue with what uh, Jean Marie said about uh, someone talking about uh, current issues and uh, politics. Uh, I stood at that podium uh, last year on September 5th and, and did the same thing. My comment was at the end, though. You know, I talked about issues, and then at the end I said that I was running, so it was really nothing to do about it. So, so I just think, I just think uh, we've had a lot of experiences with uh, situations where we, we put a lot of pressure on curtailing uh, people that want to exercise their First Amendment rights. And I think we've had some really prominent examples of those having to do with certain ordinances which I'll, shall remain unnamed. So I think we need to kind of, let's, let's be real about that and make sure we're balancing. Uh, you know, needs for people to talk about current issues with, uh, you know, what the Constitution provides for us. Thank you. And, and I'll kind of close that. I don't usually say a lot. Two things, one kind of a, on a positive note, one not so much. The first would be kind of echo the ad hoc committee, but from a different perspective. These folks that have stepped forward are going to be doing a lot of work in a short period of time, and I'm just amazed that we even said and we reached out, we actually thought that we everybody wouldn't be able to do it. The fact that everybody on the list agreed to do it, I think just speaks volumes about the community and trying to give back. And so as a real positive, the second thing that's really hit me is I have a, our youngest has left home and gone to college. But boy, I tell you, for all the parents out there and students, vaping has become a huge issue. I know it was a huge issue in the senior class I talked to someone who has a child in the Brunswick school system, the intermediate, inter, whatever the word is, the intermediate? In, 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 intermediate schools, they're doing it in the bathrooms, but it's, it is a scary thing. So I don't know if, I don't know how involved the community is in that, but man, we need to reach the youth because it's almost epidemic and it's scary. Mm -hmm. So on that, not, on that cherry note, uh, <laughs> <laughs> are we ready to adjourn? So moved. Yes. Yes. Thank you, everybody. No, vote, everybody. All in favor? Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thanks.